You're listening to Chicago Stories, a podcast from City Hall featuring the stories of everyday Chicagoans, as told to Mayor Rahm Emanuel. This is Mayor Rahm Emanuel, Chicago Stories. We have historian Michael Beschloss uh, with his new book here, Presidents of War. So let's just jump right in. What made you decide this topic, given what you've done on Johnson and uh, Kennedy and Roosevelt? Why this and this project? Uh, Well, you know, I've written all these individual books about presidents, and most of them involving individual wars. But Mm -hmm. what I could never figure out is that when the founders wrote the Constitution in 1787, one of the things that they were most worried about was that this new job, president of the United States, might begin to resemble the dictators and the kings of Europe. Mm -hmm. And especially in the way that dictators and kings, especially British kings, if the king began to get unpopular, one of the ways he'd get his popularity back would be to... Not, not that they were driven by popularity. No, 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 never, 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 <laughs> never, never. A wrong motive. Nothing uh, like that. That yeah. would be wrong, as Richard Nixon would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The king would fabricate a reason for war. The country would go to war. Everyone mm-hmm. would unite behind the king, and everyone loved the king again. Mm-hmm. They wanted to make sure that that never happened with American presidents. They wanted to make sure that presidents only took America into war if there was an absolute necessity, if Congress was totally united behind it, and the people were too. And so that was the way it was supposed to be. Then we go all the way fast forward to our own time. And as you know, these days... That's not the Gulf of Tonkin. Right, not the Gulf of Tonkin. It's Mm -hmm. not, you know, wars of our own time. Mm -hmm. For good or ill, a president now can take us into war almost single-handedly and almost overnight. So what I wanted to do was to write the story of all these presidents waging these major wars and understand behind the scenes why they did Mm -hmm. and what their lives were like, but particularly how we came to be exactly what the founders never wanted. Clinton always said if he had had a great war, he could have been, and he had obviously Kosovo and Bosnia, he could have been considered one of the greats. Why do wars make presidents either great or failures? And I I mean, I am not all the way through, and maybe you take this on later in the book, and I just got to stay tuned, but why is war, unlike economic deprivation, et cetera, or some other type of crisis, why does war play that role in a president, a definition of our rankings of president? Well, FDR is a good example, and economic de- deprivation was exactly mm-hmm. what he was dealing with in 1933, the Great Depression, and he came up with the New Deal. That made him a very considerable president. Mm-hmm. But what made him a great president was dealing with the biggest war in our history, World War II. Mm-hmm. And the most supreme test, I think, of presidential leadership skills is how you deal with the question of possibly send young Americans into harm's way. Mm-hmm. LBJ, a president that you and I love domestically, mm-hmm. civil rights and Medicare, yeah. you know, that huge great society program, not all that worked, but, you know, wonderful. In, move the needle. Move the needle, you know, to this right. day, changed our lives. But you get to the Vietnam War and this Gulf of Tonkin, 1964, he claims there's an unprovoked attack on American mm-hmm. ship in the Gulf of Tonkin goes to the House and Senate that gives him a nearly unanimous resolution to use military force. And Johnson and Nixon waged the whole Vietnam War based on this flimsy resolution based on an attack that a couple weeks later, Johnson knew that never happened. Mm -hmm. One other thing that really, as I say, I so admire Johnson in one way, but it shows his limits. 1965, I was doing these Johnson tapes. Mm And he's talking to McNamara, his defense secretary. And this is the first month, February of 65, when he's sending big numbers of Americans off to potentially die. And he tells McNamara, I can't think of anything worse than losing the Vietnam War, and I do not see any way that we can win. This is the beginning of the war. He hasn't even pulled, quote unquote, the trigger on sending 100, I think it was 165,000? Exactly the number. Yeah. And he's sending off these idealistic I get a name, my Mike Paul Beschloss historian class right there. Okay, I would like to. Uh, you <laughs> a, a plus uh, for, for that and other reasons, Rahm. Uh, yeah. But here he is, beginning of of 65, at the beginning of this war, and he's going and he's sending off these idealistic kids and saying, we're going to win this war, maybe even by 1966. And in private, the beginning is telling his defense secretary something I don't think we're ever going to win. I love Johnson, but that's pretty close to a A very major bad thing. I mean, I knew about, obviously, the controversy around the Mexican-American War, but I don't think I fully... We we both went to schools in Chicago and its environs. Right. But... I didn't realize all of 
Polk's duplicity. Do you find, given that your premise is it had to be the whole country and we make this major change, not the king, he himself alone, do you see Polk's predicate of duplicity around the Mexican-American War and uh, not telling people, A, his full intentions, and B, he actually forced Mexico into a conflict? It's a fake incident. Yeah, totally. He contrived it. And he was a liar and a cheat and a bully. And you read his diaries, and his diaries are unbelievable. It's, it's basically like, you know, today I cheated my Secretary of State. Today I lied <laughs> to this uh, person. And he was proud it of it. It puts Watergate in a totally different It position. sure does. Uh, you know, didn't start with Watergate, as other people have said. But is that where you think the premise or the principle it, it's the constitution exactly starts the moment. to get? It's exactly the moment because he basically goes to Congress and says, all right, I'll ask for a war declaration, but I'm going to do it based on lies Mm -hmm. and fakery. And it's also ends versus means because these are horrible means and corrupt and Mm -hmm. undermine the Constitution. Yet his purpose was to get about a million square miles of new territory for the U.S., make us a coast to coast nation. Wonderful aim, but he did it in a very corrupt way. One question that I thought about, and I'm reading your book, is you have Eisenhower, military launches him, Grant, Jackson, Taylor, and Washington. Five presidents with military history, their military background launches him to the presidency. And I may, I may be short of my knowledge of history, but not one of them get us into a major conflict. And what is it about their military background that it may be as interesting of what who gets into a war why these people who understand war never took America to war. I mean, Eisenhower obviously ends the Korean War, if anything. So do you, have you ever thought about that, explore that sure question? I sure have. They understood the suffering that war can bring. Mm-hmm. And it gets to the question of one way I rate presidents is, do they look at the soldiers as chess pieces to be moved around even if they die, or is there an emotional connection? Mm-hmm. Nixon would say, I can't get emotionally involved. I have to look at these people as chess pieces. I have to do war almost mathematically. At the other end of the scale, in more ways than one, was Abraham Lincoln, who said to a friend, can you imagine that here I am in this war causing there to be oceans of blood, I who cannot even watch a chicken being slaughtered? And one thing that Lincoln did was he never wanted to be disconnected from the people dying. And he had, as you know, this summer house up the hill from Mm -hmm. the White House to get away where his family went. And he said, all right, there's a new cemetery that has to be built. I want the cemetery to be built right near my summer house so that every time I go there and every time I come back, I see the graves that are being dug of dead Union soldiers who have died because of my decisions. Unless I keep emotionally connected to that, I can't be a good commander in chief. And I think that's exactly the reason why generals who've had that kind of experience make very good presidents at times. Do you think then, it's not in the book, but fast forward, do you think war has become too distant from Americans to actually evaluate the consequences, not just presidents, but the choices we make? Absolutely. Because, you know, A, the founder's idea was the president goes to Congress, there's a big debate, it may last weeks, and the members of Congress say, all right, how long is this war going to last? How many people killed? Mm -hmm. Would have been very helpful to know those things before we got involved in Vietnam, for instance. And the other thing is that wars, as you know, and I think we've talked about this in the past, they're fought by an increasingly shrinking sector Mm -hmm. of American society, oftentimes people who don't have other opportunities. And, Mm -hmm. and, And the whole idea originally was that if you're going to make the sacrifice to go into a war, the sacrifices are borne by all equally. Mm-hmm. One thing that Johnson did, which was to his credit about 1967, and I write about this in the book, he realized that the people who were fighting in the war in Vietnam were, there were too many African Americans, too many Latinos, too many of the poor. It was a slice of society, not the society. Exactly right. And mm-hmm. he changed the draft deferment so that more rich young white kids on campuses would be drafted. And if you look at the big protest against Vietnam on the campuses, that's what happened after Did that he, happened. Since he, I do, not only was he a successful domestic, he is one of the most successful political strategists. Did he know that the draft would trigger? Yes, he did. So he even, so he knew he wasn't going to war on the real reasons, and it was a lose. And did he calculate that the draft would actually create a political opposition? 
to he, the war. He knew that, and huh. that's why he delayed it so long. And he found the two things were at war within him. One was this was the president who'd done more to liberate African Americans in the society hmm. than any president since Lincoln. And he knew, this is my language, not his, how could the same person be the executioner of so many mm-hmm. young African Americans who were being sent off to Vietnam? What makes you think that, uh, or how do you argue that Lincoln is the greatest president, which I agree with you 100%. What's the argument besides the war? Or is the war the, I mean, it's the most dominating issue? Well, the fact that he succeeded in helping the North to reunite with Mm -hmm. the South and vanquish slavery, but it's the way he did it. From my point of view, the great war leaders, the great war presidents are not just those who know how to deal with their generals or have good strategy. They're able to explain to Americans why this is morally necessary. Mm -hmm. And in Lincoln's case, he went for more than a year. That holds the country to a purpose. That this is, there's a higher purpose. Mm -hmm. I mean, for about a year, Lincoln tried it the other way. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a lawyer and he basically tried to say, we've got a contract that binds every state to the union Mm -hmm. and the South has violated the contract. After a year, he felt that that was not working and also got tired of saying something he knew wasn't really true. So he begins talking about this as a moral crusade to vanquish one of the great evils in history, slavery. And that not only was more honest, Mm -hmm. and it not only made him feel more comfortable, but it also gave people who were making sacrifices a much bigger purpose Mm -hmm. than just, you know, we're litigating the Constitution. Yeah, I think that uh, if Polk and others lied to the country, Lincoln was lying to himself, and he knew that that was wrong. Exactly right, and he found his voice, and that's when he becomes the Lincoln of the Gettysburg Address. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to fast forward to something outside the book. On Saturday's Wall Street Journal, you said, here are the five books on war. Again, uh, through my prism, when we were in the Obama administration preparing for Afghanistan, I was reading Lessons in Disaster. And I get, uh, yeah, okay. Do you see whose quote is on the front of Lessons yes, of Disaster? Yes. A book I think is very good. Yes, I think, and I said I gave this to Obama I and remember President that, Obama. Because we were talking yeah. about this at the time. And, uh, and Vice President Biden, I think I also gave it to uh, Axelrod. Uh, I always think that's like one of the most important books to read for, on the presidency because it really shows you the mutation and how each step almost trips you into the right foot following the left foot and it's like at what point and this is the other thing about johnson i don't get is he knew this was wrong and he did is it's exactly wrong just like what you were saying about lincoln mm-hmm. johnson knew and he even is he's talking to richard russell mm-hmm. the armed services chairman mm-hmm. of the senate his old great friend and russell mm-hmm. is telling him mm-hmm. if we get involved in this war he says on the telephone mm-hmm. on these tapes It's going to take 10 years. You'll Mm -hmm. kill 50,000 Americans, and it'll end up like Korea. We will never win. Perfect advice. And Johnson does not disagree, yet he goes ahead plunging into this war. Mm -hmm. Part of it was he listened too much to Robert McNamara, who gave him promises about what the military could do in Vietnam that were wrong. Part of it, he was terrified of being vilified as soft on communism, which Mm. he thought might weaken him as he was trying to persuade Congress to do controversial things like Medicare and Mm -hmm. civil rights, aid to education. But the other problem is, another theme of this book is that these presidents under the pressures of war oftentimes have emotional breakdowns. And Johnson is probably the biggest example of this. I listened to these tapes of Johnson, particularly in his latter years in Vietnam, 66 to 68 and 69. I'm not a psychiatrist, but he's getting paranoid. And he's saying things like the reason why Bill Fulbright, the Mm -hmm. Foreign Relations Committee and the chairman of the Senate, is opposing my war is because Chinese communists are giving him cash. Well, there weren't not many Chinese communists in Washington in 1966. We had to wait 20 years for that election. Right, to yes, happen. <laughs> that, that happened later on, but didn't happen in 66. And he began to get very suspicious and angry at those who posed him on the campuses, angry at Bobby Kennedy, who was against yeah. the war. So too much of Johnson by 66 and 67 is about getting back at his own personal enemies and critics rather than trying to end the war. I think Johnson is possessed by both Kennedy and Roosevelt. Totally. Yes. So I used to joke between the East Wing and the West Wing when a president walks from home to work, 
you get three Washington oils, two Lincoln oils, a Kennedy oil, four Roosevelt's from Teddy and Frank. I said, what we really need is Polk, Taylor, Tyler, Harrison. I said, if those are your benchmarks, you can beat them. If That's every, exactly if, right. For every day if you walk by these nine oil paintings, That's it's going to screw funny. up your head. Exactly right. Really, I'm like, take them down. Put Polk up. We can clear Polk. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can definitely clear Polk. And yeah, Tyler help. right next to him, if that's your measure, you got this, man. Be, Don't be, go for the fences. Much more healthy for it. All right, that, that'll be the Emmanuel yeah, rule. We'll right. see if we can get We're it We're taking through. all the Roosevelt's down. All the can- It's not an insult. You're just messing with the guy's head all day long. We don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> Here's a an, um, Lincoln lays out the uh, land-grant colleges, a domestic initiative. Roosevelt, at the last nine months, I think he's alive, does the GI. Thing. Sure does. I don't know. I forgot the Eisenhower time on the infrastructure, but the domestic Kennedy is also laying out at the height of the Cold War what's going to come next. What's the pressure points between domestic and international? Why does every president, and this is what I think George 43 Bush missed, every president has a peace dividend. And this Clinton had a peace dividend and he wasn't on the Cold War. So what is, and that's post the war, but in the war, the p- battle between the New Deal and the war and how the war consumes a president and basically shrinks their domestic initiative. It does, but wars also give presidents a degree of influence they didn't have before, and they can do a few domestic things because of that increased stature. A wise leader once said, never let a crisis go to waste. That guy was a genius. Uh, he was, <laughs> and, 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 and that guy It's studied. the latter half of the sentence. Never allow a good crisis go to waste. It's the opportunity to do the big things you never thought possible and make them possible. Exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly right. And I you, was like specialist to get an A in my class. Okay? Uh, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> hard, <laughs> right, right, we're working hard. And you said that because you know history. Mm-hmm. And so if FDR had tried something like the GI Bill, wouldn't have been about GIs, but helping mm-hmm. younger people to go to college before the war never would have passed. Mm-hmm. If Kennedy had asked for the moonshot without a Cold War, never would have passed. The Republicans, even in the Cold War, said this is costing too much money. We shouldn't do it. So the great presidents, just as you're saying, use the fact that they have this increased impact with the mm-hmm. American people and with Congress to do the things that a president should in any time. You think the issue of domestic sacrifice for the war was that the, here's the payback, that there's just that pure transaction with the public, not that they're more than just latitude, that, that after all these you know, we're going to go on rations as we did in uh, World War II, all the lost lives and limbs and uh, the Civil War, et cetera. The Cold War, you know, everything going to the military versus yeah. the rest of it, that it's just here's what the sacrifice was worth and you're going to get X. Absolutely right. And part of it is just politics. You know, mm-hmm. you're taking sacrifices for a Cold War, mm-hmm. which are sterile. You know, it goes into a military mm-hmm. that most people don't. Mm-hmm. see a lot of benefits from, although obviously bases, and it helps mm-hmm. the economy in general. But as you were saying, Eisenhower in the mid-1950s, when he was for the Interstate Highway Act, mm-hmm. he called it the National Defense Highway Act, and mm-hmm. the justification was we really need these highways mm-hmm. to cross the country because in case we're ever invaded, we need, we need to be able to take a truck from Wisconsin mm-hmm. to Texas. Well, everyone knew that that wasn't really the reason, but it was one way of saying that I'm asking the people to wage a lot of sacrifices uh, in fighting mm-hmm. the Cold War, and you know, let me give you back a few things that are good for you, too. Why was Johnson so enamored with Eisenhower, even though he was possessed by Kennedy and Roosevelt? He envied Eisenhower for two reasons, particularly. Number one, Eisenhower was a military hero. Mm -hmm. Johnson was almost the opposite. He got a silver star Mm -hmm. after being in combat for about, I think it was 12 (laughs) minutes uh, during World War II, and yet it was awarded to him by General MacArthur Mm -hmm. because he was a very powerful member of Congress. Mm -hmm. And the other thing was that Eisenhower had something that LBJ knew that he could never dream of, and that is... The majority, nearly all of this nation, loved him. He was this great unifying figure. LBJ knew that he had some talents, but that was not one of them. Do you think Eisenhower was a good general or a great politician? Well, I think both. And being you do think the, both? I do think both. And 
even as the supreme com commander in World War II, mm -hmm. what did that take but a wonderful politician who was able to knit together all sorts of different generals from different countries, Montgomery, that, that's the skill set you would have wanted. Yeah, I, didn't I read uh, Atkinson's book, Army at Dawn. I didn't realize how close Eisenhower was to getting the boot Absolutely. after Africa. Absolutely. Or during, right in the sure. middle of Africa. Sure. Like, do you think uh, Roosevelt made the right decision with Eisenhower over Marshall? Uh, it, it killed Roosevelt to choose Eisenhower over Marshall mm -hmm. because he felt that Marshall, as he said at the time, deserved to have his name known after World War II. And something else you may not know, Dulles Airport, which is the big right. airport in Washington, D.C., Eisenhower wanted that to be called George Marshall Airport. It's not far from where mm -hmm. George Marshall lived in Virginia. And the reason it didn't happen that way was that Eisenhower's Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, happened to die just before they had to name this airport. And that was the thing Eisenhower that wanted said. to do it was because he was guilty of what he did in Wisconsin. Absolutely. Totally guilty. Uh, of moral which, courage. That's where he had deleted praise yes. of George Marshall from a speech in Milwaukee. One of the most cowardly things yes. Eisenhower does. Yep. Uh, and it's, uh, now, do you think Franklin Roosevelt made a mistake not bombing Auschwitz? I, do. I mean, not a mistake. That's not the question. Do you think he knew what was going on, even though the defense said not? I know that he knew by the summer of 1944. His secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, came to him and said, you have to do more. You have to bomb the railroad lines, perhaps. You have to bomb Auschwitz. And Roosevelt refused, Why? saying that because his whole thing was he was saying, and I totally disagree with this, I can't start you know, changing my tactics and strategy because of the pleas of a particular group. He flunked the test, and I wrote a whole book on this called mm. The Conquerors, he flunked the test of understanding what Winston Churchill knew, which was the ho Holocaust was something that was unique and uniquely horrible in world history and should not have been judged by the standards of other battles and other wars. It is wars. amazing to me. I think, I think Roosevelt is one, two, or three greatest presidents with one and two of the greatest moral failings. That and the internment and of Japanese, Japanese Americans. It's un, and, and it's a, which always gets back to all of them are in the end of the day, all too human. You're always yeah, getting people with huge flaws and hopefully huge strengths. And as you and I have discussed before, that's why they're so fascinating to study and read about. Hmm. You got Afghanistan, Iraq, two longest wars. You have Bosnia and Kosovo. I, would, I don't know if you describe those as a war. Um, you stop at Vietnam. Do you think Bosnia, Kosovo, and I remember this distinctly, which was the House actually split on the vote. I think it was 165. Yeah. It was like very, it was exactly down the middle. So close. actually they did not support the war mm -hmm. or the military action. Mm -hmm. um, and you have the two longest wars. Do you think we're getting back to the principle that was lost from Polk to Johnson to the Gulf of Time? Or what's the lessons? The lesson is that the best war presidents are people who have leaders in Congress fighting with them every single minute makes them better presidents. One problem with George W. Bush, among others, during Iraq. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 43. 43 yeah. Iraq and Afghanistan was he had, for the most part, very friendly leaders in the House and Senate. You remember that because mm -hmm. you were there. What you want, and this is what the founders wanted, they wanted people who would challenge him all the time. Mm -hmm. Johnson hated the fact that in waging the Vietnam War, he had Fulbright, you know, mm -hmm. chairman of foreign relations, Mike Mansfield, his majority leader, both anti-war, but he knew that they were questioning what he was doing and how much he was spending and what the strategy was. He hated it. He was angry at them, but he knew it made him a better war president. He did know that. He did know that. Now, so didn't I, remember it all the time, but he knew it. <laughs> the thing with uh, Iraq given the weapons of mass destruction that never materialize as the basis, which is a close, I would, I mean, I'm obviously reading the book and I'm thinking things that I went through sure. or the country went sure. through. It's like the closest to Polk's not honest justification and we were playing around with the data and the intelligence coming from the CIA. And I mean, so to me, that's kind of like the closest I can remember, you know, not that there's not other reasons for uh, duplicity by a president. Well, when you have this history of these fake incidents that led to real major wars, mm -hmm. it makes people more suspicious. One of the questions people ask most often is, 
did Franklin Roosevelt deliberately mm-hmm. encourage Pearl Harbor to get the nation into war? They wouldn't say that if we didn't have this history of these fake incidents. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first time I took my kids to ground zero, maybe a year or two after 9-11, I heard a crowd shouting 9-11 was an inside job. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that this was orchestrated to get us involved in a war that perhaps President Bush wanted. That didn't happen that way, but we're a darker and more suspicious country nowadays. And the problem is two things. Number one, if a president wants us to go to war in the future for honorable reasons, people are going to be much more skeptical of those reasons. And number two, and God forbid this should ever happen, but... If a president ever wants to get involved in a major war for political reasons, to, mm-hmm. to elevate his poll numbers or to help himself— A wag the dog moment. Wag the dog moment. He can do that under this new arrangement, and we've got to just watch like a hawk to make sure that that never happens. Do you distinguish or think through after this the difference between military action versus a war? Well, and how would you describe it? Do you, they're fine grades of each other, but— Sure. Uh, military action, you know— is something that a president can authorize and it falls short of a major war. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about wars with thousands of casualties that last a while in most cases Mm -hmm. that historically we look as important historical turning points. And I'm not saying that if, God forbid, there's ever a cyber attack or a terrorist attack Mm -hmm. or a nuclear threat, I'm not saying that the president, rather than respond within 15 minutes, should go run to Congress and say, what do you think? Do you think then, when looking uh, current, that uh, President Obama made a mistake on Syria, that he should have taken action and not have to kind of go to Congress and act like that? And if you don't want to pass judgment... I I can't do it historically. One reason this book ends with Vietnam, (laughs) and on this I'm pretty much a purist. You don't want to to write about what you actually had on this other... Well, what it is is that... I'm just teasing. Yeah, no, 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 of course. (laughs) But, you know, I've written this whole book with almost all the documentation that's been released and with decades of hindsight and that's why i didn't want to write about iraq and afghanistan because i can't yet see the intelligence documents that Mm. president bush saw and we've got no hindsight on afghanistan yet because it's still going on so Mm. i try to sort of uh stay out of things that i don't do as well as history what do you think about wilson uh i think very little of woodrow wilson really very little Uh, I admire his progressive reforms, but as a war president, you know, people think of Wilson as this great, eloquent speaker who just did nothing but explain to Americans why we're involved in World Mm -hmm. War I. He almost never did. He spent the first year of World War I and Americans' involvement, which only lasted— You think he's elevated as a president then? I think he is way overrated. And that that is even above and beyond his views on race, which are detestable and Mm -hmm. almost disqualifying. But setting those aside for a moment, he spent most of his first year while Americans were fighting in Europe holed up in the White House feeling that he didn't even need to explain to Americans at great length why they they had gone— really into their first foreign war Mm -hmm. across the seas. So the war is won almost exactly 100 years ago next month. And then he says, well, surprise, this war was not just to respond to a specific need, but you didn't know it, but it was a war to end all wars, and it was a war to make the world safe for democracy. Biggest case of mission creep I've seen probably ever in American history. So while he's then trying to get Americans to accept the League of Nations, this peace organization, totally laudable aim, I'm all for it. You know, you're a student of political leadership, what does he do? He decides that he's the only person who can negotiate this in Paris. So, first president Biggest mistake was not bringing the opposition in on the game. uh, Yeah, he goes to Paris, barely even includes a Republican in his entourage, spends months That was laudable in my view. Huh? Well... (laughs) In terms of diluting the result. (laughs) Uh, But so he's spending months in Paris, and just in terms of political leaders, so he's in Paris, no modern Mm -hmm. communications. So guess who's dominating the dialogue back home about the League of Nations? It's all of his enemies, all people who hate the League of Nations. If he had let some diplomat negotiate the treaty, which that person could have, and if he had just stayed home and said to Americans, you have to understand how important this League of Nations is, is because we have to make sure this world war will never happen again. Instead, he lost it. He had a stroke. He spent the last right. nearly year and a half of his presidency inert, and the result was a great tragedy. No League of Nations, 
the rise of Hitler, mm -hmm. uh, the rise of World War II. No, it's in, uh, I would say Wilson is an enigma. Yeah, well, I think you're kinder than I am. Uh, I think Enigma well, you're would smarter be the, than me. No, so. no, no. That, <laughs> enigma would be the kindest <laughs> thing I, I could say. Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis. Do you st take it? I think Kennedy deserves more credit for getting us through that crisis than he does for anything else. Because 13 days at the beginning, almost everyone in the room is telling him, bomb the missile sites, invade Cuba. We now know that the Soviet uh, officers on that island have been told to fire the missiles if that happened. If that happened and if the missiles were mm -hmm. nuclear, you would have had a nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union mm -hmm. almost instantly would have killed, what, 60 million people? Would have incinerated much of the Northern Hemisphere? You tell me, was who was running Cuba in 1962 worth? It's also the amazing, do you ever, what's your favorite book on that moment? Uh, well, one that actually as a primary source is Robert Kennedy's 13 Days. I love which the one is, minute to midnight. Yes, also oh, really good. Unbelievable, because yes. of what it gets out of the Soviet Union. At Absolutely. That. I also think, I mean, it is the incredible lesson. It comes out of the, I think, uh, who's the head of the Air Force at that time? Uh, Curtis LeMay. Yeah, LeMay, where basically the military was egging on a nuclear the cop. joint chiefs of staff were telling the president of the United States, if you don't go in and bomb those missile sites and invade Cuba, you're a coward and we will denounce you. And Kennedy, to his undying credit, yes, stood up to them and said no. And many of us would not even be here if it were not for well, Kennedy. Well, the world would be totally... Absolutely. Yeah. So, and the uh, 73 Yom Kippur War, you wrote, I mean, I saw this piece the other day about if it wasn't for Kissinger and a drop-off that had to be taken out of Brezhnev and Nixon's hands because both of them had lost it. Yeah. Had to either lost alcohol a, or painkiller or right, med there's, medicine. There's this memo that is a, it's a record of a call between Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft, who was his deputy mm -hmm. at the time, deputy national security advisor. And the British prime minister, Edward Heath, is calling up right during the Yom Kippur War. And so uh, Scowcroft says to Kissinger, I believe it is, one of them says to the other, I'm sorry, the president can't take the call. He's loaded tonight. You know, tell him anything. <laughs> tell Heath anything. It's really one of the most amazing. And Brezhnev's letter, which is they think is, you know, so full war language. And they said, well, there's out of character, but they couldn't understand. And the misunderstanding of that. Yeah. And that's why, you know, we think of presidents, what we need from them. One of them is to manage crises like this. And... LBJ's good deed in Vietnam, it's one of the scoops in my book, is that I found that in January of 1968, William Westmoreland, the, his commander in Vietnam, had asked him to move nuclear weapons into South Vietnam and win the war if necessary yeah. and put off defeat. And Johnson, to his permanent credit, says, not on your life, you know, this will never happen. Shut down all such planning. And what's more, I want every document about this to be locked up in a safe for years. That's how I got this just a couple of years ago, because it took that long mm -hmm. for it to be de declassified. Just as we were talking about Cuba, Ron, can you imagine if no. there had been nuclear weapons used Not with in that Vietnam? that same crew running, well, Kennedy, it was the same crew Kennedy stared down. Johnson was... Exactly. With those joint chiefs and that commander, and if there had been nuclear weapons fired in anger for the first time, since Japan, 1945, this became a nuclear same war. Same region of the world. Same so. region could have drawn in Russia and China, could have once again killed tens of millions of people. Was the fate of the regime in Vietnam an agricultural country worth all that? Hmm. Johnson at least had the sense to understand that. That's what we always need from a president. My thing is, I look at the Cuban Missile Crisis and Khrushchev's second letter. You look at the weapons of mass destruction and what... Saddam Hussein tried to do. And then you look at Brezhnev and this whole era, and there's other instances. How do you appreciate the quote unquote, the head of state or the opposition that really a lot of their language has nothing to do with you. It's all domestic. Absolutely. And, you, we, and those who are sensitive, where I think Kennedy showed in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when they switch letters or basically that there was a domestic audience that Khrushchev was worried about. Not he an he knew that Khrushchev had generals breathing down mm -hmm. his neck saying, you know, you have to send Kennedy this nasty letter. Okay. And Kennedy had the stature and the judgment and the wisdom to 
set that aside and try to keep things mm-hmm. peaceful. Uh, we have a rapid round. This will test your Chicago-ness, okay? I'm, I'm afraid I'm, it, I, I should you, say. You'll, you're ready. All right. right. I, I lived in Chicago till I, and around it till I was 12. <laughs> so in case I screw up on this, that's that's my plea of innocence. <laughs> Don't, this, this is uh, extra points for you. Don't worry. It's a fast round. Cubs or Sox? Cubs. Uh, that, see, you're comper- thick or thin pizza. Uh, thick. Really? Sorry. Still I, to this day? This is when I was 12 years old. Here, okay. Rob. Okay. Uh, in the honor of, because of the uh, chapter 11 of Sears, I'll say the Sears Tower or the Hancock Tower. Oh, you, the Han- my father actually, his office was in the Hancock. Oh, so that's, okay. Can you be more Chicago than no, that? No, you cannot. Uh, the lake or the river? Oh, uh, the lake. Yeah, we have to have to get back on a summer day or a spring day, but you're allowed to say that. All right. Am, yeah. I, am I allowed to tell one quick mayor story? Sure. Let me just finish my quick round. Okay, yes. No, it's a fine. 16 inch or 12 inch softball. Uh, 16 inch. Okay. Your story. And also, by the way, uh, on the plot of ground where I was born in Michael Reese Hospital, I'm <laughs> sure you know that's where softball was invented that, in the history of Chicago. I did not. And there is. I can I, tell you uh, something. No, oh, yeah. Well, give me the. It was invented right there. There's a plaque on that ground just where. Absolutely. Well, I got to go see this. Okay. Okay. That's, All right. I can't leave office without knowing that. Okay. Or seeing that. All right. Quick Chicago story. Yeah. The elder Mayor Daly, 1976, Jimmy Carter gave an unfortunate interview to Playboy magazine, mm-hmm. Lust in My Heart, and so mm-hmm. on. Right. Mayor Daly, right in these offices, was asked by reporters, What do you think Carter's Playboy interview? No comment. So he finally tried to distract the reporters by taking out a picture of himself. He had caught this big fish in Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. This is 1976. Sam. So reporter <laughs> says, what did the fish think of Carter's Playboy interview? <laughs> and Mayor Daly said, couldn't resist. He said, the fish told me if he had kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have gotten caught. <laughs> Proving that Richard J. Daly was a lot quicker and smarter than people. Which you and I know nice. and knew. This is Michael Beschloss. I, I want to so thank you for taking time oh, to I'm do so this. Oh, I'm so thrilled. Love it. Now, I already talked to our head of libraries. We're having you back. Wonderful. You, hometown, you got a, we get two visits on the book tour, not Would one. We love that. All right. Okay. E- even thin crust pizza. <laughs> no, no. We're, we're okay with okay. that. You, you passed. You got, four, you, got four, you got five out of five, man. Okay. All right. <laughs> Michael Beschloss. Thank you, man. Thank you a lot. Great to see you. You've been listening to Chicago Stories with Mayor Rahm Emanuel. You can subscribe and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tweet your guest ideas using hashtag ShyStories. Thanks for listening.